So, chapter six, all about electrons and what are they doing, where are they, what's happening. And the first thing that comes up, guys, is something that should be familiar. You should have learned this in Chem 1. It is something called the electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic radiation. There's all types, okay, and we'll talk about some of them. And what is on this graphic here? All right, you have different types of electromagnetic radiation. Along the top, you have wavelengths in meters. Very short wavelengths, long wavelengths. Okay, now let's just make sure we know what that is. If we're talking about things that travel in waves, Okay, the wavelength is the distance from, what do you call the top part of a wave? You can call it multiple things. A crest or a peak, all right? Your wavelength is the distance from peak to peak or valley to valley or um, trough to trough. The numbers down here on the bottom, these are frequencies another characteristic of a wave. High frequency, lower frequency. Okay. Frequency is just the number of waves that pass a particular point per second. Okay. And let's just talk about some of these, these types. All right, we'll start on the left here. Gamma rays, that's a term that should be familiar. Do you remember from Chem 1? You hear about gamma rays, we talked about like alpha decay, beta decay, do you remember that? Okay, gamma decay is another type of, of radiation. Very short wavelengths, high frequency, high energy as well. Okay, you're mostly gonna hear about this when you hear about nuclear weapons or um, radioactive substances, okay? Um, are you guys familiar, do you know about the Chernobyl disaster? Okay, so um, big nuclear power plant in the Ukraine, I think. Um, big explosion, lots of radioactive material spilled everywhere. Very, very dangerous to be around. In fact, even to this day, people are still not allowed to go into that zone, except for a handful of scientists, and even those scientists can only be in the zone for very short periods of time because there is still so much radiation there. Okay, it's very dangerous. And why it's dangerous, gamma rays, okay, can pass through the human body, and when they do, they tend to target your DNA. Okay, now think back to biology. If you start messing with a person's DNA, mutations, deletions, do you think these are good things that should be happening to you? No, they're not, okay? When you start messing with the DNA of a person that tends to lead to some form of cancer, that's just what happens. Um, another example, um, the scientists that worked on the Manhattan Project, do you know what that is? Okay. The scientific endeavor to build those nuclear bombs that we dropped on Japan at the end of World War II, most if not all of those scientists died of cancer. Okay. They're just constant exposure to gamma rays is no good. No good for the human body. Okay. And guys, I think of this spectrum here. It's not a perfect relationship, but kind of in order of extreme danger to humans to totally harmless. Okay. Now, it's not a perfect relationship, but it's close. Okay. So we've got gamma rays. Are x-rays dangerous? Yeah. Okay, 
I would imagine everybody in this room has had some kind of an x-ray, even if it's just one at the dentist, all right? When you get an x-ray, are you exposed to x-rays for a long period of time? No, it's very brief. And what, have you ever had to wear like those aprons or things on the other part of your body that's not being x-rayed? Do you know what it's made of? It's really heavy, it's made of lead. Lead is a material that x-rays cannot penetrate. X-rays, little bit smaller frequency, smaller amount of energy content, they don't pack enough punch to get through lead, okay? Are x-rays dangerous? Absolutely. Most of the scientists that helped to develop the technology of the x-ray machine died of cancer. Okay. Science is dangerous, people. Do it at your own risk. All right. Ultraviolet. What time of year do we hear about this a lot? Summertime. Okay. Dangerous? Yeah. Okay. Can cause skin cancer. Okay. Can burn you, obviously. If ultraviolet light gets in your eyes, it can burn your retina. That's really bad. Okay. A little bit less energy, but still still dangerous. How about visible light? Dangerous? No. Okay. Um, and by the way, I am not expecting you to memorize, you know, the frequencies or the wavelengths of any of these things. Something that I would expect you to know is that in your visible light spectrum, violet has the short wavelengths, violet visible light, whereas red has the longer wavelengths. So you've got visible light, keep moving, smaller frequency, we're getting longer in our wavelengths. This is infrared, okay? Um, a common place that you'll see infrared light in your everyday life, if you ever go to um, a restaurant that has those, um, like an open kitchen where you can see everything happening, sometimes you'll see the chef will fix the plate, but it's not quite ready to go out to the table. They'll put them under these red heat lamps. That's infrared light, okay? A heat lamp is just a lamp with a infrared bulb. Okay, keep going. Microwaves, okay? Now, I don't mean a microwave oven. I mean a microwave. A single microwave, pretty harmless, okay? But is it a good idea to put yourself or any small pet, perhaps, into a microwave oven? Absolutely not! This should be a resounding no, everybody, okay? You will kill a living thing if you put it in the microwave. And I don't know if you guys know how microwaves work, but I'm going to explain it to you. Okay, a microwave oven works because in the way that it, it does not fire just a single microwave, it fires billions, trillions of microwaves and they're, they're all sort of concentrated, focused on that sort of central area of your microwave. Have you ever microwaved something and like one part of it is molten lava and the other part is still frozen? Have you ever done that? That's because those microwaves are focused in a very centralized place. So if you put, you know, your frozen whatever kind of off to one side, that part that's off to the side is probably not going to heat up as fast. Okay. But microwaves are perfectly suited. They're exactly the right frequency to cause water molecules to shake, okay? Refresh my memory, guys. What is the definition of temperature? Average kinetic energy. What is kinetic energy? The energy of motion, movement, okay? If you cause something to increase its motion, its temperature will go up, and that's how a microwave oven works, okay? Now, 
I'm revealing my age here. Microwaves came out when I was a little girl. And when they first came out, people just didn't know. And people didn't use their brains. And there were cases where a pet owner, let's say, would say, oh, I'm just gonna give my little cat Fluffy a bath, but I need to dry Fluffy. I'm just gonna put Fluffy in the microwave. Fluffy will blow up, okay? Because any human, any pet, any mammal, any, any kind of living thing is made up probably a lot of water. We are 80% water. If we got into a microwave, we would blow up, okay? So will your pet kitten, if you put your pet kitten in the microwave. Please don't do that. On the extreme end, ladies and gentlemen, we have radio waves. And by the way, if any of you are wondering where like cell phone radiation falls, it's right in here. It's between microwaves and radio waves. But let's talk about this. Okay, when I mean radio waves, I mean like AM, FM, if any of you have like serious satellite radio, okay, that's in here. Guys, look at these wavelengths. This is in meters, a thousand meters long. That is a very, very long, stretched out wave. And I want you to do a little experiment. Okay, the next time you are in a parking garage, okay, like maybe one of those ones at Tyson's, for example, right? If you have a ra your radio on and you go into one of these parking garages, you will almost always lose the signal pretty quickly, okay? Let's think about it. Very low frequency, low energy. Guys, what are parking garages made of mostly? Concrete, okay? Radio waves carry so little energy content, they can't power through concrete. So you'll lose the signal, okay? I'm not sure where satellite frequencies fall in there, like Sirius XMs where that falls. AM radio waves are the longest, and I'm sure a lot of us don't listen to AM radio a lot. It's a lot of like gospel music and smooth jazz and you know, <laughs> you know, maybe that's your thing. I don't mean to rain on your parade. Maybe that's your thing and rock on, but um, you will lose an AM radio station before you lose an FM station, okay? So, the point is, guys, we've got a relationship here between wavelength and frequency. And you guys tell me, what kind of relationship is it? As the wavelengths get really, really long, what happens to the frequency? Way down. Same with energy content. Energy and frequency are directly related, okay? So we've talked about wavelength, this is primarily going to be in units of meters. We've talked about frequency. And guys, frequency you'll see two units which are actually the same thing. Frequency is waves per second, so you'll see the units expressed like this a lot. Okay, an inverse second. or you'll see units of this. You know what that stands for? Hertz, okay? These units are the same. They represent the same thing, just like tor and millimeters of mercury are the same thing. It matters not to me which one of these you use, okay? But also, just so you're aware, you know, if you listen to, let's say, just as an example, let's say you listen to DC 101, that radio station, and on your radio, it says 101.1. That number is in units of megahertz. The number associated with radio stations, that is their frequency, okay? I just didn't know if you guys were aware of that. 
Okay. Now something that all electromagnetic radiation has in common is its speed. You do not have to memorize this number. It is on your equation sheet. And by the way, everything for this chapter, guys, is all in this very first section on your equation sheet. It says atomic structure. This is a constant, and it's given to you. Don't memorize it. Okay. So this equation is on your equation sheet. C is the speed of light. It's a constant. It's given to you. Lambda is your wavelength in meters. Frequency, inverse seconds. That is not the letter V, ladies and gentlemen. That is a lowercase Greek letter nu, N-U. It looks like a V. It's not a V. Okay. But you have this equation. And I just want to, out of curiosity, see if any of you know this, okay? This is wavelength. Do you know what this distance is called? Yeah. Amplitude. Okay. For those of you that are music people, okay, you'll probably know the answers to these. Let's say you are listening to a person play the trumpet, okay? If the person playing the trumpet, this sound wave that you are hearing, if they change the frequency of a sound wave, what are you changing about the sound? You know? The pitch, okay? High notes are called high notes because they have high frequencies. Low notes, low frequencies. Okay. What if this person playing the trumpet changes the amplitude of that sound wave? What are you changing about the sound then? The volume. Yeah. Okay. The volume adjusts the amplitude of that sound wave. All right. What if it's not a sound wave? What if it's a visible light wave? If you change the frequency of a visible light wave, what are you changing about that light? Say it, Claire. The color. The color. Yeah. Okay. This would be like a red color, whereas this with the shorter wavelength, that might be like green or blue light. What do you think you're changing if you change the amplitude of a light wave? Someone said it as the answer for the first one. The brightness. Do any of you have dimmers on your light switches at home? Okay. All you're changing is the amplitude of that light wave. Okay. Just wanted to see if you all knew that. Okay. This is another equation. Don't memorize it. It's on your equation sheet. You don't really have to worry about this other part unless you want to. Okay. This is how we can calculate the energy of some electromagnetic wave. Okay. E is energy in joules, just like we're used to. H is a constant. It's called Planck's constant. Don't memorize it. It's on your equation sheet. And this Greek letter nu, that's frequency again. If you choose to use this guy, lambda is your wavelength once again. Okay? So you have some equations to work with, nothing to memorize. And I will talk about what, what I'm referring to, this word quanta here. I'll talk about that later. There is another equation that is credited to Einstein that is not on your equation sheet, but you might find helpful. You're probably familiar with it, okay? E is energy, M is mass, C is the speed of light. Okay, now there's something we've got to 
clear up here, learn a little vocabulary. I keep saying electromagnetic radiation, it travels in a wave, it travels in a wave. Well, what travels in a wave? Air, what? What's traveling in a wave pattern are photons. And ladies and gentlemen, the word photon is just a shortening of the longer word photoelectron. Okay? Guys, a photon is an electron. Okay? Now I want to preface this by saying that depending on if you are more of physics minded versus chemistry minded, physics and chem people kind of disagree a little bit on what I'm about to talk about. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question and the way you answer it is gonna tell me whether you're on the chem side of the fence or the physics side of the fence. Consider your answer carefully. <laughs> All right, so a photon is just an electron, right? Does an electron have mass? If you say yes, then you're on the chemistry side of the fence, and you may stay. If you're on the other, you have to go. Goodbye. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Physics people will say that the mass is so small, it's negligible. It's basically zero. Okay, well, basically zero isn't zero, people. All right. Does it have mass? Yes. Does it have a lot of mass? No. Very, very small mass. But that's where this comes into play, right there. Okay. So, let's just make sure we've got this. We understand what light and electromagnetic radiation is. Okay. I'm actually going to alter this graphic here just a little bit. Okay. Light is a stream of photons. Yes, that's true. But I don't like the way this is drawn because it makes it look like it travels in a straight line and it doesn't. So I'm gonna use my fancy technology here. Okay, this is how I would prefer they drew it. Are you ready? This is exciting. Ooh. Fancy. La, 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 You get the point. Okay, that's what light would look like if you could actually see it, like if you could see the particles. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you a question, and it's going to seem really, really strange to you. Can we say anything that has mass, you, me, a baseball, anything that has mass and is moving, would you agree that I am moving right now? walking, okay? Can we say that anything that has mass and is moving is traveling in a wave? I'm walking. Do you think I'm traveling in a wave? If I throw a baseball, is it traveling in a wave? Yes, it is. Okay. Does it look like it to your eye? No, it doesn't, but it is. And here's the thing. I mean, when I walk down the hallway, I don't feel like I'm walking in some serpentine path, all right? But I am, okay? Even though it doesn't feel like it. What do you think, what part, what characteristic of a wave is so small that your eye can't detect it? My wavelength, okay? I actually went and did the calculation. I used my mass, which I'm not going to tell you, okay, and I said if I'm walking down the hall at about a meter per second, I use that as my speed, about a meter per second, my wavelength was something like 1.4 times 10 to the negative 37th meters. Do you think you could make that out with your eye? I don't think so. No. Okay. When you watch a baseball player throw a ball, it doesn't look like it's traveling in a wave. It is actual. Okay? 
I promise you, I'm not making this up. Let's get to some calculation here. These questions are all connected to one another. So this piece of information can be used for all three. I'm only giving you one piece of information. You have equations to use. You have constants available to you. Figure it out. So guys, in number two, you were asked to solve for the energy of a photon, meaning one single photon. When it says, what is the energy in a mole of photons? All you have to do is multiply it times the number of photons that are in a mole. So, show of hands, tell me how many of you in your Chem 1 class did a lab some kind of related to a flame test lab where you change the color of the Bunsen burner flame. Okay, so a lot of you, not all of you. Okay. But for those of you that have done that lab, and even for those of you that haven't, we're going to use that lab as our example for how to understand what's going on here. Okay. We've been talking a lot about electromagnetic radiation. Let's Let's narrow that focus to just visible light, okay? And we can see visible light in two ways. And please don't try and copy down these, these definitions. I would rather explain them to you with a picture. Okay? This picture. Any time that you are presented with all colors of the rainbow, okay. all wavelengths of visible light, that's called a continuous spectrum. A continuous spectrum just means the whole rainbow. Okay. And what's that mnemonic device they teach you in elementary school? Roy G. Biv, to remember the order of the colors. I don't like Roy G. Biv. I prefer Vib G your. It's backwards. Okay? Think about it. Vib G your. I prefer that because I prefer to think of the colors from short wavelengths to long wavelengths. If you like prefer it, prefer Roy G Biv. You are preferring the rainbow in order of increasing what? Not wavelength, frequency. Now, does it really matter what order you know them? No, it doesn't, okay? The point is, anytime you're seeing all colors of the rainbow, that's called a continuous spectrum. If you are seeing only certain wavelengths, this is called a bright line spectrum. This is what you saw when you did the flame test lab, those of you that have done it. We tested specific elements. We got them on a, um, a little wooden stick, we called them wooden splints, and we took these elements and put them into the Bunsen burner flame, and you saw that the Bunsen burner flame changed colors. What color does a Bunsen burner flame usually burn? Blue, okay. When you put, for example, the element potassium into a Bunsen burner flame, it's purple. It changes the flame to purple. Okay, now, will your eyes be able to detect these individual colors? No. Since, if you'll notice, most of these wavelengths are kind of clustered down at the blue-purple end. Helium, or excuse me, hydrogen, you would see a bluish purplish color. Neon, you'll notice most of these lines are clustered down towards the red-orange. You would see helium burn a bluish-orange color. Okay. And we'll talk about what's causing these lines. Okay, but before we can talk about that, guys, you need to be aware 
not today's model of the atom, but the one just before today's model of the atom. It was called the Bohr quantum model, and it looked like this. Nucleus at the center, and your electrons are orbiting the nucleus, just like you know planets orbit the sun, on these paths. See what you remember from Chem 1. Do you remember what these rings are called? Not orbitals. Somebody said it. Energy levels. Energy levels. Okay. So the Bohr model says electrons are going around the nucleus and they are situated on these energy levels. Okay, fine. Well, let's come back to that flame test lab. Okay. When you have an atom and its electrons just sort of hanging out, not doing anything, we would describe the electrons as being at ground state. Okay. When I say the lowest possible energy state, what I mean is an atom whose electrons are as low, as close to the nucleus as they can be. Electrons are just going around the nucleus. They're not doing anything special. They're as low, as close to the nucleus as possible. In this flame test lab that we will do, we'll take these elements and we'll put them on a stick and we'll put the stick in the flame. The electrons in these atoms will absorb, that's an important word right there, absorb energy from the flame and they will jump to what's called excited state. Electrons are normally found at ground state. When they absorb energy from the flame, they will jump up. And when I say up, I mean they will jump out, further away from the nucleus. Okay. You can remember this by thinking about how people behave at a sporting event. Okay. You're at a soccer match, it's your favorite team, and your team just scored the game winning goal. You're excited, right? Nod your heads. Yes. Okay. When people get excited at sporting events, nobody ever does this in the stands. No one ever gets excited and just crouches down into a ball on the floor. What do people do when they get excited? They stand up out of their chairs, they put their hands in the air, okay? They stand up. Ground to excited state, electrons move up or out. Okay. Now here's the problem. Much like when you get really excited about something, you can't stay in that state for very long. Okay. It's like being on a sugar high. You're gonna crash. Electrons can't stay in excited state very long, so what do they do? They fall fall back to ground state. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the important part. When electrons fall from excited to ground, energy is released in the form of light. Let me say that again. Excited state, very unstable position. When these electrons fall from excited to ground state, energy is released in the form of light. And when we do this flame test lab, guys, that's what you're gonna see. If you put an element in the Bunsen burner flame and you see this bright red light, the electrons are falling and releasing red wavelength light. Now let's talk about why we see different colors. And I'm gonna give you the most ridiculous analogy that I would never do, but go with me on it. I want you to imagine that I have some kind of like mental breakdown of some kind, and I decide that I just can't take teaching anymore. And instead of walking out the door, I decide a better course of action would be to shimmy out the window, and then I just fall down on the ground, okay? <laughs> That's like a three foot fall, I would say. Do you think I'm gonna hurt myself if I do that? Am I gonna break a bone? No. 
I might hurt myself, mostly my pride, okay? <laughs> but I'm not really gonna hurt myself. What if I decide, if I'm an upstairs teacher and I just, I just can't take it anymore, and I go out the window upstairs, am I gonna break a bone? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Am I gonna die? Probably not. I mean, it's grass, it's not concrete out there. But what if I decide to, what if I fall out of a 30-story window? I'm dead, okay? I'm dead. Okay? This is ridiculous, but tell me in which situation am I hitting the ground with the most energy? The high rise out of the 30-story window. Bring it back to electrons. If electrons fall a great distance, they will release more energy. And guys, tell me this. In the rainbow, which end of the rainbow, red or violet, is the higher energy end? Violet. violet. Yeah. So if an electron falls a far distance, you'll see blues, purples. Whereas an electron falling, falling, but just falling a short distance, you're going to see reds oranges, less energy. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, now, don't write that equation down. Don't write it down. It's not on the AP exam. It's not on your equation sheet. You won't use it. I'm only putting it here to illustrate a point. This is an equation no longer on the AP exam used to calculate the energy of an electron sitting on a particular energy level. Okay. What I would like for you to do, get your calculators out, calculate for me please, give me this number, the energy of an electron sitting on energy level number two. Plug in the number two for n. Should be negative something. Five point, okay. Times 10 to the what? 19th. 19th, okay. And that's, that's at level two. Can you do this calculation again, except this time, what's the energy content on energy level four? Tell me what you get. 1.36? Okay. And that's at level four. Well guys, I care less about these individual numbers. I care more about the difference. If I'm talking about an electron falling from four to two, energy at my final energy level minus this one, I'm going to subtract this. Subtract these numbers. What do you get? Negative something. Four point what? Times ten to the negative nineteen. Okay. Again, you're not gonna do these calculations. I'm just trying to illustrate a point to you. Guys, this is an energy. Think of it as like a heat value. What does a negative energy value mean to you? Think thermochem. Endo or exo? Exo, which means release, right? All I've done, ladies and gentlemen, is mathematical proof that when an electron falls, energy will be released. And it's released in the form of visible light. Not heat, but visible light. You won't be doing those calculations. I was just illustrating a point. Okay. Okay, this 
next topic, in all honesty, guys, I was kind of unsure of where to put this in our year curriculum, and so I just sort of decided to put it here. It's going to seem mildly out of place, and that's okay. It's on a topic called spectroscopy. For those of you that took honors chemistry here at Oakton, and you did the water testing project. Do you remember doing something where you had like a sample and you had to put it in like this little black, small little black machine thing and you put it, you close the lid. Okay, that machine was called a colorimeter. Not a calorimeter, a colorimeter. A colorimeter uses spectroscopy. It shines a beam of light, that's why we're putting it in this chapter, through your sample of water or whatever it is, and it measures how much light passes through or doesn't. That will tell us, here's the key word right here, the amount of light that gets through or doesn't tells us how concentrated something is. Let's think about just a real world situation. Let's say you're making Kool-Aid, okay? Like from the powdered mix, the red Kool-Aid, okay? And you like Kool-Aid, but you don't like it really, really, really sweet. So the instructions say to add one scoop, but that's too sweet for you. So you add just half a scoop to your glass of water. What is your Kool-Aid gonna look like? Is it going to be like electric red or is it going to be clearish? Clear kind of clearish. Okay. If you shone a flashlight through your glass of Kool Aid because you didn't put very much Kool Aid in there, most of the light would pass right through. Very little of that light would be absorbed. Okay. Whereas, let's say you're the other extreme. You like your Kool-Aid sweet. You like it so sweet, you don't even get out a glass. You just pour water into the container of the Kool-Aid. Gross. Okay. Think what your Kool-Aid's gonna look like. Electric red. If you shine a light through your Kool-Aid, no light is getting through. Because you have so much dissolved particle in there. Dissolved solute. Okay. There is an equation that goes with this. Don't memorize it. It's on your equation sheet. It's in sort of a strange place. It's not here. It's on the back. It's at this very bottom of this gases, liquids, and solutions section. It's called the Beer-Lambert Law or the ABC equation. Okay. I'm not even gonna do a practice with this, guys, because literally, it's just, you will be given three out of the four variables and you will have to solve for the fourth. I think you can handle that. These two, molar absorptivity and distance, those two will almost always be given to you. You'll be solving your unknown will be one of these two. And in all honesty, it's usually going to be this guy. A molarity. Okay? So think about it for a second, guys. If you have a very, very concentrated Kool-Aid solution, let's say, very, very, very red, and you shine a light through it, is a lot of light getting through or not a lot? Not a lot. Most of the light will be absorbed by the Kool-Aid, okay? Or blocked by those dissolved solute particles. The greater the concentration, the greater the absorbance. I put that in this chapter because it has to do with light, but I could have also put it in our solutions chapter because it deals with molarity as well. So let's wrap this up. 
This, ladies and gentlemen, is the name of today's model of the atom. Okay. And what I have on this slide, as I told you before, this is related to the topic of quantum physics. Please don't ask me any follow-up questions. Right? Here's the deal. Okay? True or false? Electrons are outside the nucleus of an atom. True. True. True or false? Electrons are moving in an atom. True. Okay. Now think about what the Bohr model said. It said electrons are orbiting the nucleus, but they're on they're locked onto these energy levels. That's not exactly true. They do travel on energy levels, but guys, they don't travel in perfect circles. They travel in waves. Didn't we say that anything that has mass and is moving travels in a wave? Didn't we say that, even ourselves included? So this is how they move around the nucleus. Now let me explain about the quantum part of this name. Quantum means like whole numbers, set amounts of things. An electron on energy level five, and don't ask me how they know this or how they found it out, I don't know. An electron on energy level five as it goes around the nucleus, will complete five complete wave cycles. Watch. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. okay. An electron on energy level four completes four wave cycles. This doesn't happen. Okay. Quantum means whole numbers, set amounts of things. Electrons will not complete fractions of cycles, whole numbers. If you would like to know more about this topic, go ask someone else. Okay. Now, this should be familiar to you. You should have learned this in Chem 1. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I think it's funny. It basically says we are certain that we don't know what electrons are doing. <laughs> We're certain about it. We are certain that we are uncertain. All right? And let me, I'm going to give you another ridiculous analogy. All right? I want you to imagine that I clear out all of the furniture out of this room. And I turn off the lights, I pull the blinds, it is completely pitch black in here. No light, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And I tell you that somewhere in this room, and you know how much I love balloons, there is a balloon floating in this room. And you have to find it. How are you gonna do that? Walk around, what else are you gonna do? Just, just like this? Okay, exactly. You're going to move around, waving your arms in the air, trying to find this balloon, right? Okay. Well, think about it. If you're walking around like this, you might actually locate that balloon if you get lucky, but because you're swinging your arms around, as soon as you locate it, because you were moving your arms, now you've batted it away. So you found it, but now it's batted away and now it's somewhere else. So you've got to keep looking. The point is, the act of you looking for it moved it, changed it. And it's the same thing with electrons, guys, okay? Let's say I'm a scientist and I am trying to observe this electron right here, represented by my fist. Here it is. I'm trying to look at it. I want to know what it's doing. To see something, don't we need lights? Microscopes have a light source, don't they? Yeah, you can't see something if it's dark. 
So I'm observing this electron. I need a light source. Let's say the lamp is over my right shoulder. I turn it on. It's shining on this electron I'm trying to look at. Guys, what is light physically? What is it? It's a photon stream traveling in a wave. Well, what's a photon? It's an electron. Okay, great. Here's the electron I'm trying to observe, right? Here's my light source. I turn the light on, here comes the light. These are the exact same size. It's like, it's like playing pool, like billiard balls. If I want to observe this electron, I can't because my light source is going to move it, change it, change its location, change its speed, its momentum. The act of observing it changes it. If I want to know how electrons really, what they really do in their natural state, their natural habitat, I can't because in order to observe them, I need the lights to be on, but if the lights are on, then that changes how they behave. The point is, we can know certain things about electrons, but we can't know everything all at the same time. Okay? This is our last slide, guys. As wonderful as it looks, ta-da, this is today's model of the atom. Okay? But sometimes today's model of the atom is called the quantum mechanical model. Sometimes it's called the electron cloud model. It looks like a cloud, all right? A cloud because we don't really know where the electrons are. This is called a probability cloud, meaning the closer to the center I get, the greater the probability that I will find an electron. I can't know for certain whether I'll find it, but the probability goes up as I move towards the center. It's called radial probability. The further away you are, the lower your probability. I'm gonna stop there.